This video is supported by EmuDB, the world's fastest immutable database. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshiks Mainframe channel. This is Moshiks. In the Western world, in the 50s and 60s, more and more use cases for usage of computers were found and therefore production and manufacturing of diverse operating systems and computers exploded. However, behind the Iron Curtain, in the Soviet Union and states controlled by communist Soviet Union, the pictures were was quite different. First of all, manufacturing capability and electronics uh, capabilities were far below what was present in the Western world in those days. And most use cases for computers were focused scientific computing and engineering. But before we go any further, let's switch to the commercials. Systems Network Architecture. We've moved from chatting around Cracker Barrels to communicating via telephones and switchboards and into the world of computers. At first, all computer action pivoted around its central processing unit, the CPU. But today, computer power is spreading out and computers are communicating and exchanging information with each other and with people via online terminals. From central banks to branches, from offices to warehouses, from counters to stockrooms. To handle the growing traffic, communications facilities expanded into networks, transmitting data via telephone lines into broadband cables, microwaves, and satellites from city to city and around the world. And we're back from the commercial break. So as we were saying at the beginning of the video, the Soviet Union capabilities in all areas of computing, such as electronic um, capabilities, uh, manufacturing capabilities, design, as well as also the use cases where computers were being used or could be used in the Soviet Union in the 60s and 70s were severely restricted. And that meant that computers were primarily used for scientific and engineering purposes only and that meant that they were uh, much more um, the soviet union was much more geared towards using higher bit sizes such as 36 and 37 bit computers because that would give you more that would give them more precision in computing i think it also makes sense to see how the soviet union and for instance the united states differed in manufacturing and economic capability in those years. If you look at this chart, you will see that, of course, we have a huge spike in uh, GDP growth um, in the during the war effort. And of course, here in the Soviet Union, because of uh, secrecy, we don't know much about what happened during that time, the Soviet Union. But afterwards, you can see that the, the United States had fantastic uh, GDP growth enjoying from after the uh, after the war, World War II effort going into, well, of course, into the 90s and beyond. Whereas you can see here that the growth in the, in the Soviet Union was much more modest, uh, both in terms of growth rate as well as in absolute terms. And so we need to see the Soviet uh, computing capabilities in the eyes of what uh, the difference was between the United States and the Soviet Union in those days. The Soviet Union was suffering under communism, was suffering under market economy and on the planned economy. And you could not think of a worse environment than the market economy and communism and market and, and, and failed market economy of the Soviet Union where to ha have engineers uh, innovate and create innovation and create new and amazing computing um, uh, ideas. So it is perhaps no, no surprise that during the period of 1951 to 1970 in the Soviet Union almost 60 computer models were developed. Although accurate production figures are not available, it is safe to say that fewer than 20 models of this 60 computer models that were made, fewer than 20 of those were produced with more than 100 units apiece. And from the 60s and 70s, the Soviet Union started to focus on cloning machines that were successful in the Western world. And in the beginning, it focused mainly on the 
digital equipment PDP series, the PDP 11 series that we all know and love uh, with the famous RSX, RTS uh, operating systems that were prevalent in those days and uh, beginnings of multi-sharing. Again, the Soviet Union didn't really care so much about business use cases and time sharing. They were much more focused on using disk computers and copying and uh, and um, reverse engineering this, this architecture so they could be used for their space programs, for the defense programs, as well as other nefarious uh, purposes uh, back in the Soviet Union. And because of this focus on scientific engineering computing, several disk devices that were becoming very common in the US and in the Western economies, such as terminals, such as disk drives, were almost completely absent in the Soviet Union. Now, only starting from the 80s, you started to see terminals and disk devices being more common in the Soviet Union, but up to the late 70s, disk devices were almost unheard of. And if they were present, they were extremely unreliable so that the use of those, um, those devices really made no sense at all. And so the Soviet Union embarked on an effort during the late 60s and early 70s to go and reverse engineer the IBM S360 architecture. It is important to note that they didn't just copy, copy the um, the electronics and the circuits of the S360 and S370 because they couldn't be manufactured in the Soviet Union. It was impossible with the capabilities and the precision and tooling of the time in the Soviet Union to create the same electronics or to even copy the electronics of the S360, even if, of course, they had, um, through the efforts of the KGB, obtained the circuits of the S360 and S370. The country was not able in big numbers in serious production to produce those computers the same way. So they had to embark on a true reverse engineering of the architecture. So they started from the, from the architecture and from the instruction set. And from there, then they using the production capabilities of the Soviet Union started to then reverse engineer and re-implement the S360 and S370 architecture uh, on uh, Soviet designs. And so it is important to understand that we're not just copies, there were true reverse engineering models and accomplishments of the Soviet Union and as such I think they are to be admired. And of course they focus much more on the on the on the hardware side than on the software side. Now speaking of software, uh, of course the Soviet Union was uh, not doing much in terms of research into programming languages and development environments and all the good things that we had going on, on here in the US such as time sharing research etc. They focused mostly on, on just making computers work and being reliable. Reliability was a major problem of the computers in the Soviet Union all through um, the existence of the Soviet Union until the fall of uh, of the Soviet Union. So computers were not meant to be up and running all the time. They were sometimes uh, crashing after 10, 15 minutes. There were very significant uh, problems with the reliability of computers on the hardware side. And one of the side effects of that, of course, is that networks, computer networks were almost non-existent in the Soviet Union. They were much slower to come about because of the unreliability of the underlying, underlying computers. On the software side, it is also important to notice that uh, almost all the programming in the Soviet Union was done in either in binary, like straight binary, uh, as we can see here through the switches on this uh, S370 uh, um, uh, copy, or uh, in assembly language. The popular and semi-official uh, uh, programming language of the Soviet Union was Algol C60. And they had some variants in the Soviet Union, such as PHA, ALGIC, and ALGAMS. But uh, only slowly did the Soviet Union start to switch in the 60s and 70s to Fortran. And maybe only one or two compilers, COBOL compilers, existed throughout this old Soviet Union until the mid-70s. So, as you can see from the languages here, clearly, um, they were much more focused on engineering. There were some Soviet-developed uh, languages, such as Liapass, Refile, and Epsilon which were used on the on the PDP 11s but on the S360 S370 architecture uh, it was almost prevalent assembler throughout the whole line and so as the Soviet Union developed what they called the unified system which in Russian is uh, spelled Dinaya Sistema which means exactly that unified system 
and unified Edina ya Sistema is of course an E and an S and the that's why you see here a C because the C uh, in the Cyrillic alphabet is actually an S so this stands for ES not EC and the Dinaya Sistema 1035 would be a model and so, so just like we have S370 and then the model number read the S uh, the EC here as S370 and then the model now these computers were manufactured in several locations in the Soviet Union uh, some were manufactured in the uh, in Czechoslovakia, some were manufactured in Bulgaria, Poland, um, Eastern Germany was a big manufacturer, especially of the ES and the Ukraine. Um, most ES systems that we see in photographs, old photographs such as this ones, were actually manufactured in the Ukraine. And uh, this particular model here, the 1035, would be actually this would have been manufactured in Bulgaria. So they were focusing by model. So the 1035 was almost exclusively manufactured in Bulgaria. The previous model that we saw, um, uh, if we go here, this one would have been manufactured actually in Eastern Germany. Now to give you an understanding of the performance of these machines, this particular one would have been able to do about, um, this would have about 750 kilo instructions per second, whereas the slightly uh, smaller model here we see in this picture would have been at about 100 um, uh, kilo instructions, 100,000 instructions per second. So they were, as you can see, not only uh, less reliable than the same or supposedly the same systems that we had in the Western world, um, but they were also significantly slower. And this, of course, this photograph points out that this is a propaganda picture because, uh, uh, as I said, monitors were almost existing, almost almost non-existent in the Soviet Union into well into the 80s. Disk devices were very, very rarely used. It was almost all tape and uh, and punch tape and, uh, and tape devices uh, and printers. Printers themselves also had a lot of uh, reliability problems, so that printing in the U in the Soviet Union was severely restricted. Now. We, of course, and the Moshik's mainframe channel focus much more on uh, on uh, mainframes uh, compared to, of course, the PDP series. So this is what we're going to look at in this video. And so for further comparison, if you look at this particular model, the ES1035, this would have had uh, 256 or 512 kilobyte of memory, or 32-bit uh, word size memory. And um, so this was a very common system throughout the Soviet Union in the late 70s and 80s, uh, whereas the previous uh, model that we saw here before, oops, where is it? This one, uh, the much more powerful 1052, would have been up to between 256 kilobyte and four megabyte of memory. And you can see also from the design, this was a Germ East Germany uh, manufactured computer, whereas this one uh, would have been uh, manufactured as we've seen in, in Bulgaria. And um, the devices that were attached to them were also restricted. I don't think that uh, very, I, I think very few 1035s were actually sold with this kind of configuration in the Soviet Union. Um, there were just not enough demand and, uh, the, and the, the manufacturing uh, would have been a problem for those as well. Let's also remember that uh, any business in the Soviet Union which required a computer of this, um, of this size, uh, of this kind of expense, would have had to wait between 7 and 10 years from the time of, uh, time of ordering the computer until it would be delivered. And also, uh, what's interesting to notice is that every computer was kind of unique. There was the, it was not really produced in series like we understand it today. Every time that a, a business ordered a computer, it would wait for seven to ten years, and then the manufacturer would send the engineers with the parts and assemble it at the customer site. And so, all kind of um, changes were made to the electronics at the customer site, so that every installation was in fact you could say unique and the moment the engineers from the manufacturer would return to their to where they came from the computer would promptly stop to work for those people who are interested in the electronics uh, machines produced in the soviet uh, union such as uh, sorry in uh, in eastern germany such as this machine they were built using ttl electronics and uh, other countries that produce the same architecture such as bulgaria or uh, the Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia or Ukraine would sometimes use different uh, 
processes and electronics uh, all together. But in this uh, series in this YouTube channel we focus much more on the software side so let's look a little bit on how the operating systems um, were deployed in the Soviet Union now as we all know in this channel there's really three main operating systems on the IBM S360 and S370 architecture two of those are depicted here the OS360 and Descendants, such as MBT and MFT, and then later on, of course, MBS, OS390 and ZOS, which belong into this family group. And then the time sharing and virtualization operating system VM370 and Descendants, um, such as VMSP and then uh, VMESA and ZVM to this day. And then there is a third operating system family called DOS, uh, disk operating system, which then later on became DOS VS and then VSE and today exists still as ZVSE. Um, the Soviet Union focused much less on this third family of operating systems by IBM on the on the on the mainframe and instead they focus on these two environments of course primarily on this one and uh, they called it Edinalia Sistema so EC as we saw that's the that's the architecture in, in general the the hardware uh, itself was called the uh, Riyadh or Riyadh uh, architecture which has nothing to do with the with the city in uh, Saudi Arabia which is just a it's just an acronym. So the hardware side was called RIAD, but the software side was called ES, Edinalia Sistema. And here it's written in English, e -E -S. And in uh, Kyrillic, the E stays the same, but the C is an S. So that's why you see, as we saw on the mainframes in the picture before, they call, they seem to be called EC, but they're really called ES because of course they were written in Kyrillic and not in, uh, in the English alphabet. And then uh, to some extent, uh, in, to, some, to a much lesser extent, and later on, uh, the Soviet Union also started to use the VM architecture, both for time sharing, as well as for virtualization and allowing to run more than one operating system um, underneath, and especially for development purposes. And those were called SVM, System Virtualnik Machine. Uh, so SVM is what the abbreviation stands for. And if you do this, uh, write this in, in Kyrillic, then it will come out as CBM. So C is S and B will be a V. So System Virtualnik Machine, which means, of course, a system for virtual machines, which is exactly the name here. Now, of course, the Soviet Union did not reverse engineer these operating systems, right? They they had very extensive uh, uh, spying operations and and um, and uh, commercial uh, uh, espionage operations in the United States and everywhere in Europe, or the whole world, of course. And they were very, very successful in doing that, as we know. Um, and so they, of course, obtained not only the installation tapes for those operating systems, but over time they also uh, managed to obtain uh, the source code for all these operating systems. And of course, to some extent, uh, IBM made it easy for them because, as you remember, most of these operating systems in their early days were all um, in, the, uh, in the source code. And you could get the source code either um, with the delivery of the tapes by IBM or on Microfish. And only VMSP four, uh, 6, I think, changed to object only. And later versions of MVS changed to object only. Um, so that the, I, it would have been extremely simple for the KGB or whoever, uh, GRU or other organizations within the Soviet Union to go and obtain copies of this from friendly countries or friendly people within certain computer installations worldwide and they did and of course uh, they had to adapt those they have to uh, make sure that they would work with the limited capabilities of the mainframes that they were producing themselves and and that's how the opera the soviet union was operating the mainframes with ec or es and with uh, svm or cbm and as the soviet union and the the communist empire slowly came to its fall, ultimate fall in 91, 92, uh, IBM recognized the huge potential for selling into the uh, Soviet Union market. And they started in the 80s to approach uh, the manufacturers of these machines um, in the various uh, Soviet uh, states. And um, in late 80s already, you could start to see some real IBM mainframes being deployed in the Soviet Union. Also um, of interest for people here who are connecting to the NGE network that we have in the Moshiks 
uh, that I'm running together with other people uh, as one of the participants. Um, the Soviet Union had a few selected universities also participating in BitNet, and so they started to get connected in the very late 80s also in the, uh, to the BitNet network. I think there were three or four universities, not more than that, in the Soviet Union out of the thousands that they had that were connected to the BitNet. So um, this all, what I've, what I've told you here, all stands until the end of the Soviet Union in the early 90s. After that, uh, of course, uh, the Soviet Union became one of the best uh, of prime users of mainframes to this day. Uh, many people from the Soviet Union are experts in, uh, in the mainframe operating systems. Um, and many joined, of course, IBM. And IBM has a big presence in in Russia and Ukraine and all those other countries that uh, um, that were created after the fall of the Soviet Union. Now, let's look at one of these operating systems here in particular. I've never gotten any um, copy or anything that um, represents the EC operating system, so the MVT, MFT, and the MVS clones uh, by by the Soviet Union, but I was able to obtain um, a copy of a working uh, clone of VMSP um, for the mainframe, which works nicely. And um, it's called, of course, uh, people here in the West call it CBM, but of course it's SVM. And we're gonna look at that in detail. see here we're connected to a mainframe which is running the SVM or uh, uh, C CBM as uh, people call it out here uh, mainframe operating system this would be a VMSP clone by the Soviet Union and we're going to explore it a little bit and see how it's different of course as you can see the first thing is that they were using um, English alphabet uh, to represent the 3270 maps they did not have in the 80s, uh, Cyrillic um, 3270 um, fonts. Um, they did have them for certain Kix applications, but generally they were they were just using our alphabet for the work. And uh, you can see here the, from this panel, logon panel, CVM EC or ES. So as you can see here, System Virtual Net Machine. So that stands for VM, and then uh, Unified Computing or Edinaya Sistema. And, uh, and then here is the uh, version and the level is represented here. So this would be roughly an equivalent of VMSP um, with uh, a version 4.1. And, uh, and all the rest uh, seems quite uh, the same. So this would be a system as it is presented to the system um, programmer right after installation on a mainframe, as you see, similar to the one you see here on your right um, if you want to see it better oops uh, where is it again uh, let's make it a little bit bigger so that it's easier to see yeah so this would be running comfortably on one of those machines probably a little bit a later model than this one but that's how we have to imagine this um, first off right to bat they don't have a main to user they call it system programmer and I'm running this at home here, so I didn't change the passwords. Um, and as you can see here, um, it tells us that there's uh, only, um, let's see how many DASTIs are present in this system. So there's only three DASTIs. And uh, remember what I said before, disk devices were rare and unreliable in the Soviet Union. So they did not tend to have lots and lots of DASTIs or disk devices as we would have by that time in the 80s um, in uh, in the Western world, the version 4.1.0 would have been something that was around in 1984-85 uh, on IBM mainframes in the Western world, and of course the Soviet Union was always four to five to seven years behind. So this would have been probably still been running when the Soviet uh, Union, when the Iron Curtain came down in 1991-92. Um, this was generated. Let's see when this was generated. Okay, this was uh, uh, generated uh, just recently in December. Maybe I, I generated that, I don't remember. 
um, and uh, it's actually been running now today we have uh, 14th of February so there's actually been running a two month uh, period uh, quite comfortably as you can see here the time zone is Moscow MCK stands for MSK which is Moscow's abbreviation throughout the Russian language world and um, and so the other thing that we can start to look at is what uh, this square um, available if you look at on disk A, we just have the bare minimum. Oops, the bare minimum to assemble the system and uh, uh, regenerate the the nucleus or the CP of the operating system, and not much more. Uh, let me see. Rex, I think, was present. Uh, let me see what we have here. Yes. Um, so as you can see here, this is points to Rex being present and uh, potentially, but we know it's being present. And, uh, and then let's look at which directory files were available. Um, let's see here, is it um, CBM41? You also see that the uh, xedit um, editor was copied, of course, as well. So they just copied the whole, you know, um, wholesale, the whole copied the whole operating system, pro probably the whole tapes installation tapes from IBM and then started to adapt it to their needs. Um, for people who do a lot of uh, NGE networking in the community here and connect their VM370s and mbs 38s you will immediately notice that there is no uh, there is no RSCS which is the component needed to network uh, VM operating systems. So there is no um, there is no um, RSCS and so as you can see here this machine for this installation was not even meant to be uh, to be connected to other mainframes and as we said also before networks were extremely rare and few in between in the Soviet Union one is because the phone lines were not reliable two because of course the Soviet Union was paranoid about um, the Western world or America in particular spying on their networks and so they tended to not use a lot of uh, a lot of uh, networks um, so the standard we have here the standard uh, user uh, then they had something called engineer engineer in Russian which was basically the maintainer or an important person within the organization would have his own and then I see some very interesting additional machines TSW uh, those would be either this of course points to a test and maybe this will be work or production but then I saw something interesting, which is um, the use, it points to the use of guest operating systems. So you can see here, MFT. So this machine was, uh, so when 1984, when, when the Western world were comfortably running already XA, MBS XA, and of course, before that MBS SP, um, this installation was kind of, uh, was, was meant to be running MFT. And MFT, as we've seen before, is an operating system for the S370, which was the descendant of OS360, and I think available already starting from 1970, if I'm not mistaken. So clearly they were seven to 10 years behind in the use of uh, operating system. SVS is here as well, which is the um, kind of the predecessor of MBS 3.8. So they were certainly behind, I would say between five and ten years behind in the use of modern operating systems. Uh, one is because of course they had to have the machines so that those operating systems would require as well as the capabilities, the you know the instructions etc. but also because they had to obtain uh, illegally uh, those operating systems from from the Western world through the spy agencies and then and then they would have to adapt them and change them so that they would be certified to work on their mainframe as you see here on the right side. So. Um, that's uh, for me very interesting um, and then uh, not much else so this was really just meant to be running probably one or two uh, guest machines with uh, with uh, MFT or SVS and you can see here even VM370 maybe they had some copies of that running as well for maybe for the time sharing users even though of course monitors uh, 3270 monitors were not very common so uh, this gives us an insight on how this um, this operating system was going to be used. Um, the performance, uh, of course, will be very very similar to 
uh, VM SP of the era. And I think that we can safely say that CBM 410 is the equivalent of VM SP of the era. So if you go and uh, look at IBM VM SP release 4, let's see what comes up. Uh, we have your release 6, which uh, um, so yeah, that gives us the, the history and heritage. But I think um, if we see that this was released in 89, we had release 6 of VMSP. I think 87 uh, was 5, or, uh, or 86 was release 5, and then probably 84, uh, 83 would have been the time of release of VMSP um, for, um, for release 4. So uh, if they were using this in, let's say, in, in the late 80s in the Soviet Union, and they were still thinking of running MFT, and the SVS versions of the OS 360 descendants, it kind of gives you a good reference on how delayed they were in using these technologies, which were already old um, by that time for us. So by the time they were using this, uh, the, the Western world already moved on to using BMXA probably. And uh, that's of course, um, uh, kind of uh, everybody knows that the Soviet Union was a little bit backwards in certain areas in, uh, in, in technologically speaking. They were of course much more advanced in some other areas and uh, of course famously the first man in space was of course a, a, Ru a Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin followed by others and, uh, and uh, so you can't really just say the Soviet Union was pervasively behind the Western world but uh, certainly in computing they were significantly behind and suffered from uh, several deficiencies throughout the economy, such as uh, production capabilities, designing, electronics, uh, networks, uh, programmers who knew those languages, etc., etc. So you can't just focus on one area and and you know just let's say on the operating systems and then not take care of the electronics and everything and electronic manufacturing and fabs and all that stuff that goes with it. So um, it's very hard for an isolated system such as the Soviet Union to excel in one area and just not, and not advance all the other areas at the same time. And that's what we're witnessing here with the history of mainframes in the Soviet Union. Now, on the particular aspect of this uh, distribution of um, VMSP4, which for all intents and purposes, it is exactly the same as VMSP4, I would say it's a very limited use. For one, we don't we lack a lot of the components such as VTAM, we lack uh, RSCS and other components which would have been in a standard VMSP4 of the era. Um, but also, it's um, you know it's, it's it's so limited that it, it's interesting for historical purposes. And I think it's important to document it that that's what we're doing in this video. However, I think that I, for a while I was thinking, you know, what could I do with this? And I think uh, making this video is all I really can do with it. It works fine. It's very reliable. Uh, as I showed before, it's been up for two months now, uh, almost two months, and uh, it's working fine. But and pro if somebody had the VMSP4, then you probably could copy all the missing components over and get it to work. But then, but then if you have a VMSP4, then why use something which is uh, slightly modified and has weird, uh, and has, for us here in the Western world, weird abbreviations, etc. So historically important, interesting for us, but I think at the end of the day, not really useful to the community at large, even though, um, you know, you could make a claim that, yeah, we don't have VMSP in the community, but uh, a broken VMSP doesn't serve the community either, uh, or a restricted VMSP, uh, such as this one, doesn't serve the community either. So interesting to look at. I hope that I was able to convey kind of how the Soviet Union approached mainframe computing throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I hope that we learned that um, they, you know, how it is important to have a whole economy and behind to be able to produce computers with the reliability, speed, and and uh, in 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 serial, in serial production, so that the whole economy can benefit from them. And also, I think it it kind of shows that um, that the Soviet Union was very advanced in reverse engineering with the capabilities that they had available. So they didn't really clone the mainframes, as I said before. They reverse engineered them. They just cloned the software which of course is much easier to do. 
So if you have any questions about the Soviet uh, mainframe world and uh, the history, there's much more to tell, but I think we're going to stop here. Please let me know, ask any questions in the, in the comments below this video. If you like this particular video, then I would ask you to press on the thumbs up button and see you soon on this channel. Thank you. Bye.